and now I get very quiet. <laughs> so last week, um, we talked about kind of the history of um, the Mass. And one of the things I didn't really bring up, but I will bring it up this week, because today we're going to go through the Roman Missal, the introduction to the Roman Missal. And you might hear me um, read something several times out of here about the Council of Trent. Anybody know when the Council of Trent occurred? 1570, okay? 1570. And the Council of Trent was basically a response to what? The Protestant Reformation. Okay. Now, one thing that happened during the Council of Trent is that Pope Pius V, kind of when the council was over, said, and this is the way it's going to be forever. Okay? He just felt like, as the pontiff, he had the, um, the power to say, this is the way the Mass is going to be until Jesus Christ comes back. And it was like that for 500 years, basically. But when the, um, the, council, uh, the Second Vatican Council fathers got together and the Pope, you know, Pope John the 23rd, no, John the 23rd and Paul the 6th were doing the Second Vatican Council like, mm, that's not really fair. You know, I mean, a Pope from the 16th century can't just lock up the church for the rest of history. So um, maybe you've heard of this before, maybe you haven't, um, but you know, there is a movement there is a, always, there's always, there are always movements in the Catholic Church, and there's a movement in the Catholic Church that says the whole Second Vatican Council was a heresy because Pope Pius V at the Council of Trent said these things can't be changed. So there are people who, who just say, we don't believe in the Second Vatican Council, you know, we don't, won't go to Mass like it is, we have to go to the Latin Mass only, you know, it has to be the way it was when Pope Pius X said it at the Council of Trent. I mean, there are people in the Catholic Church that have just taken that stance. But I think based on what we know and based on what, what we understand and appreciate about um, our church, you know, it, it can't be stagnant. It's a pilgrim church. It's always moving. It always has to change with kind of the, the times. Um, why was the Council of Trent um, drawn up? Because of the Protestant Reformation. Um, so just as they had the need and the right to call that council in the 16th century, also we believe the Holy, Holy Spirit called us to the council of the Second Ad Ec Ecumenical Council in the 1960s. So anyway, um, this comes from the, con uh, the general instruction of the Roman Missal. Um, just going to highlight some points. I hope Father <laughs> Colombo doesn't see that I drew in the book but uh, maybe he'll never open the front. I didn't ask permission, but I just drew in it. So just some key things that I draw, drew out as I was reading through it. For the celebration of the Eucharist is the action of the whole church, and in it each one should carry out solely but totally that which pertains to him in virtue of the place of each within the people of God. Okay. So basically, from that first statement, you can gather that there are going to be parts of this that I'm going to read that are going to talk about the role of the pope, the role of the bishop, the role of a priest, the role of a deacon, the role of the laity, the role of the lector, the role of Eucharistic ministers, the role of servers, right? Because there's a hierarchy to the church, and it feeds over into the mass. And each one of us should carry out solely but totally um, that which pertains to each one of us in virtue of the place in, of each within the people of God. For this people is the people of God purchased by Christ's blood, gathered together by the Lord, nourished by his word, the people called to present to God the prayers of the entire human family. Okay? The entire human family. That, um, let's see, here we go. A people that gives thanks in Christ for the mystery of salvation by offering his sacrifice. A people, finally, that is brought together in unity by communion in the body and blood of Christ. This people, 
though holy in its origin, nevertheless grows constantly in holiness by conscious, active, and fruitful participation in the mystery of the Eucharist. Several years ago at um, Western Kentucky University, there was a group of like anti-religious, a, a little anti-religious group on, on campus. And they would have these um, seminars, these sessions. <clears throat> and one day on one of the bulletin boards, I noticed that the topic for next week was, is the Catholic Church really relevant in the world? So I went back to the students and I said, you know, next Wednesday night, this group is doing um, a, a basically a dialogue, a presentation on this particular topic. Is the Catholic Church relevant in the world today? Do you think maybe we should be there? So I think they were a little shocked when there were 10 of them and there were 30 of us. And it got a little heated a couple of times. And, um, you know, they just, you know, one of them kept coming back to, well, you know, if the Catholic Church would come up off all the gold and all the good stuff in the world, you know, there wouldn't be poverty because, you know, the Catholic Church hoards all the good stuff and, um, you know, they're just selfish and all they do is care about having to go come over for the Pope and where they come up with that. And as I was listening, um, somehow the Holy Spirit, like, touched my, my mind and my heart and I said, you know, wait just a second. I said, you may not think that the Catholic Church is relevant and that the Catholic Church is selfish. But let me tell you one thing. In the Catholic Church, every second of every minute of every day, of every week, of every month of the year, except for Good Friday, there's a Mass being said, at least one. And at every Mass, we as Catholics pray for the salvation of every soul, not just ours. If you listen to the words of the Mass, you will hear us pray for the salvation of all people. I think that's pretty relevant. So we are a part of that, and we are called to that, right? So <clears throat> that's always going to be kind of my slant, my, my slant on interpreting things, is that um, maybe, you know, going back to what we were talking about last week, maybe before the Second Vatican Council, when Mass was in Latin and the priest had his back to you, it was easy to maybe convince yourself that it was just your Mass, you know, you were just here for yourself as you were praying your rosary or doing whatever you were doing, but all the documents of the Second Vatican Council and since then talk about how we are all part of the same celebration. It can never be just about you when you're here, right? It can never be just about you. I always say that it, if we had enough money here at St. John Paul, what I'd love to do is when people come in is give everybody a white alb. So all of us dress the same. So all of us look the same, right? Because when we're here, we're supposed to be the same, right? We're supposed to be the same. Um, I remember when I was a, a seminarian, my first assignment was in Hartford, Kentucky. Anybody know Father Joe O'Donnell? out there at Beaver Dam, okay? Father Joe was amazing to me. You know, he had three parishes, he was 103 years old, and um, I would go with him to all these different parishes, and at every parish, when somebody came up for communion, he would say, the body of Christ, he would say their name. And I thought, that is the coolest thing, right? I'm gonna do that, right? I wanna do that. And I would even try to trip him up. I would like call somebody and say, take your kid to another mass in a different town, you know, and see if he can get their name if they're not at home, and he could. So, um, when I was first ordained, I mean, at the cathedral, I would sit at night and go through that picture book so I could know everybody's name. So when you came to me communion, I could call you by name, right? Well, when the new Roman Missal came out, it said, you absolutely do not do that because it makes you an individual. And when we're at Mass, we're not individuals anymore. We're all part of the whole. So, you know, when people complain about, well, I don't like doing that, well, I don't either. I mean, I want to call you by name. But the church said it doesn't work theologically. It's not, it's not part of the way we celebrate, and so you stop it. And so I stopped it. I don't like it. I would love to call you all each by name. 
Um, it would give me more incentive to know your names, too, <laughs> because I know about three, but anyway. Uh, but anyway, so that's always been and will always be kind of my take on the liturgy, is that we are all in this together, right? And anything that draws us out of togetherness is just not in line with what the church is calling us to. So even the things I highlighted, you're going to say, wow, there's a pattern here. Okay, but it's all in here. <laughs> okay. Just kind of going back to what I was saying at the beginning. For when the fathers of the Second Vatican Council reaffirmed the dogmatic pro pronouncements of the Council of Trent, they spoke at a far different time in world history. And for that reason, were able to bring forward proposals and measures regarding pastoral life that could not have been foreseen four centuries earlier. Right? The Council of Trent had already recognized the great catechetical usefulness contained in the celebration of Mass, but was unable to bring out all its consequences in regard to actual practice. In fact, many at that time requested that permission be given to use the vernacular in celebrating the Eucharistic sacrifice. To such a request, the council, by reason of circumstances of that age, judged it a matter of duty to answer by insisting once more on the teaching of the church as had been handed on according to, um, according to which the Eucharistic sacrifice, in the first place, the action of Christ himself, whose inherent efficacy is therefore unaffected by the manner in which the faithful participate in it, right? And since no Catholic would now deny a sacred rite celebrated in Latin to be legitimate, the council was also able to concede that not rarely adopting the vernacular language may be of great usefulness for the people. It just didn't make it official. So even in, in the Council of Trent time, even the 1570s, they realized that the vernacular was important, but they just didn't take that step to say we probably ought to do mass in the vernacular and the other sacraments. Above all, the Second Vatican Council, which recommended that more perfect form of participation in the mass by which the faithful, after the priest communion, received the Lord's body from the same sacrifice called for another desire of the Fathers of Trent to put into effect, namely, that for the sake of a fuller participation in the Holy Eucharist, at each Mass, the full faithful present should communicate not only by spirit, spiritual desire, but also by sacramental reception of the Eucharist. Okay, now, this is one of the things, um, that part right there, that we are called to share um, all the faithful after the priest receives communion, should receive the body from the same sacrifice. Okay, what does that mean? Anybody know what that means? Yes. Um, one of the things that we, that we try to do, that our bishop really encourages us to do, um, is that at Mass, you receive what's consecrated at Mass, that we don't go to the tabernacle and bring out 500 from last month. That you, know, that you celebrate and receive the same Eucharist that I consecrate and that I participate in, right? Um, another thing that, um, that is, is touchy, and, and COVID has kind of made it a little bit different. Um, you know, it used to be very much highly recommended that the host that the priest consecrated, you know, it was usually big. I'd break it up into 20 pieces. I would receive from that, and you would too. So, you know, in the old days, the presider had his own host, and he didn't share that with anybody, right? Remember those days? Well, now kind of we're back to that, because I'm not supposed to share my host with you all. I don't like that. I can't wait for that to change, so I can go back to what it says, you know, that we all partake in the sacrifice that has just been offered, that is just, you know, the, the, the consecrated host that has just taken place with all of us gathered here. So yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, Here it just talks about the reception of communion under both kinds. Okay, now the importance and dignity of the celebration of the Eucharist. Um, 
the celebration of Mass as the action of Christ and the people of God arrayed hierarchically is the center of the whole of Christian life for the church both universal and local, as well as for each of the faithful individually. For in it is found the high point both of the action by which God sanctifies the world in Christ and of the worship that the human race offers to the Father, adoring him through Christ, the Son of God, in the Holy Spirit. We talked about that a little bit last week. Remember how basically the prayers of the Eucharistic prayer are offered to the Father, right? With Christ, with us, together, we offer the prayers to the Father. It is therefore the greatest of importance that the celebration of the Mass or the Lord's Supper be so ordered that the sacred ministers and the faithful taking part in it, according to the state proper to each, may draw from it more abundantly those fruits to obtain which Christ the Lord instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood and entrusted it as the memorial of his passion and resurrection to the church, his beloved bride. This was fittingly, this will fittingly come about if, with due regard to the nature and other circumstances of each liturgical assembly, the entire celebration is arranged in such a way that it leads to a conscious, active, and full participation of the faithful, namely in the body and in mind, a participation fervent with hope, faith, and charity of the sort which is desired by the church and which is required by the very nature of the celebration and to which the Christian people have right and duty and virtue of their baptism. I think St. Paul must have written these paragraphs because there are no periods, they're all commas. You know, Paul didn't know what a period was. He just put commas. So he must have been the inspiration of this one. Okay. So the entire celebration is arranged in such a way that it leads to a conscious, active, and full participation of the faithful. Okay. I think that's so important. Active, conscious, and full participation. You know, I always say that I wish that, that we could just like have a lottery and every week that like two of you could sit up there where I sit through the whole mass, you get me, John? And look out and see how fruitfully active, um, what is it? Conscious, active, and fully participating the people of God are when they're at mass. Okay? What's that? Conscious is, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, I hate to keep being this guy, but I, I, I will. You know, and men are the worst. Men are terrible at mass. Just don't participate. I, I'm doing a book study with some men, um, and the book is kind of about that, about how do we get men kind of alive in their faith, kind of wake them up from their spiritual coma. Um, and admittedly, you know, um, the Mass isn't the most exciting thing. Um, you know, it, it does seem to speak more to a female, maybe, than a, than a man. I mean, it's kind of romantic. It's, you know, it's got these romantic elements in it. It's, it's kind of ritualistic and, you know, it's not wild enough for a man. I mean, men need excitement, right? We're kind of adrenaline, junk, adre adrenaline junkies. So, you know, I get it that it's, it's hard sometimes maybe for men to get there, but we have to get there. We have to be, um, what was the word again? Conscious, right? And intentional, intentional. Yesterday, um, we had the, the family retreat for the first reconciliation and first communion kids. And I spent a lot of time with them, like as second graders, third graders, fourth graders saying, when you come into church, you need to be intentional, right? Okay, this is not intentional, right? Okay, it's supposed to be a genuflection, right? You're supposed to go your knee to the floor. You're supposed to think about what you're saying. I am your servant, you know. I am here to serve you. It's not just unintentional, like, okay, I think I'll do this, and I'll go into my seat, and I'll just sit down here, 
and I'll think about what I'm going to do, what I'm going to eat after Mass, you know, and all that stuff. In order to be intentional, you, you're intentional. When you bless yourself with the holy water, okay, do you say, Lord, help me to be priest, prophet, and king. Help me to live out the mystery of the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Christ. Or is it just, eh, eh, <laughs> don't get me wet, right? Okay. When, when I was at St. Thomas Aquinas the first weekend of school, I would tell them what I expected. And I would say, if you're not wet when you come out of, away from that baptismal font, you're going to go back. <laughs> there should be water dripping off of you. You know, you should splash up that water on yourself to remind yourself. But, you know, people hit it like, oh, with a fingernail. Oh, uh, uh, I'm going to, you know, what's going to happen if I get wet? You'll dry. Okay. <laughs> but yes, that's intentional, right? To be intentional. Um, so, yes, that's very important. Um, it's so hard to just like pick up a spot where I would, because every paragraph is one sentence. Okay, so here's kind of the first part of um, the ecclesiastical nature of the celebration. The celebration of the Eucharist is always endowed with, the, with its efficacy and dignity since it is the act of Christ and of the church in which the priest for fulfills his own principal function and always acts for the sake of the people's salvation, right? So that's my special duty. You know, I have to be thinking about the salvation of the world, every Mass that I have, right? Not just my excitement, my joy, my whatever of, of the Mass, but that I'm there in the person of Christ to sacrifice all the stuff that goes on in my head when I'm up there trying to preside for the sake of the whole, for the sake of the salvation of all. To that end, he should, be, he should also be vigilant in ensuring that the dignity of those celebrations be enhanced and in promoting such dignity, the beauty of the sacred place, of the music, and of the art should contribute as greatly as possible. Okay? I understand that. I love the art. I mean, I love, I mean, I'm doing flowers and stuff until we get the committee going because church has to be romantic. It has to be, remember what was the word I used last week? What's my job is to woo you, right? Okay. So for me, it all makes sense. You know, if you come home from, from work and the wife has flowers on the, around the table and candles burning and the good china out, it's going to be a good night, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Okay, she's got your favorite song, you know, our song playing in the background. It's going to be a good night, okay? Well, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to woo you into this good time with Jesus, right? So the decorations are important. The music is important. You know, Patty does great at picking great songs that go along with the theme of the Mass. It just doesn't accidentally happen. She's very intentional about that. Um... This is, this is one, too, that, I, and this is, I mean, I hate reading these things out loud, but they're true. The priest will remember that he is the servant of the sacred liturgy, that he himself is not permitted on his own initiative to add or remove or to change anything in the celebration of the Mass. <laughs> I highlighted that because I try to be as, 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 obedient as I can be to the rubrics, right? The rubrics are all like these little red things that are written in here that tell me what I'm supposed to be doing and what it says in the, in the beginning. There are a few things that I don't, I don't obey. I don't obey. Now, really, I'm supposed to preach from the ambo, except, except in special circumstances. Well, I think y'all are pretty special. <laughs> so I declare you all a special occasion every time I preach. One of the scriptural references that I love about this, and I never made this connection until I read this. Uh, maybe, maybe you've never um, heard this interpretation before. But in an outstanding way, there applies to such a logic, uh, local gathering of the Holy Church the promise of Christ, 
Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. So when you have somebody that says, you know, I don't need to go to church. Right? I find God out in the woods on Sunday morning when I'm hunting, right? I'm in that tree stand. I have never been so close to God. Well, you're wrong. Because Jesus says two or three have to be gathered. You can't just do this by yourself. And so that's why church is important, because we are called to gather together as a community, realizing that Christ is present when we gather in his name. The Mass consists of, of two parts, namely the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, okay? For in the Mass is spread at the table of both of the God's Word and of God's body, and from it the faithful are to be instructed and refreshed. And refreshed. See? That's on me. That's on Patty. That's on the, the ministers, right? Our job is to refresh you. You know, we just had a liturgy committee meeting not too long ago. And one of the things that, that really upsets me sometimes um, is that the LC and the sacristan at St. John Paul, I don't think they're refreshed at Mass. I see them frantic. You know, they're worried about, okay, why didn't you show up to do your thing? And now we got to get a server. And now we got to lock the doors. And now we got to do this. And now we got to do that. And the whole time I'm like, do you get anything out of Mass? You know, I hate to say, you know, you probably need to come again. <laughs> when Mass is over and they're back there cleaning things and picking up things and all that stuff, I'm like, did you get refreshed at all today at Mass? I doubt they do. And it's because, you know... I believe this. You need to leave refreshed. And I think people sometimes that have responsibilities at church, the choir members, you sing. Do you feel refreshed? You do because you get to sing. You don't have to, you don't have to ask somebody to sing with you or take up the gifts or carry the candle or all that stuff that falls back on that poor liturgical coordinator, right? I think we just need to like just let it happen <laughs> see what happens yeah okay <laughs> Deacon John could take it no <laughs> it is also for the presiding priest to regulate the word of God and to impart the final blessing he is permitted furthermore in a very few words to give the faithful an introduction to the mass of the day after the initial greeting of the penitent to write this was something that I, I didn't realize. And going back to Father Joe O'Donnell, he did this. You know, it, the general instruction actually gives the priest permission to, like, talk between, like, so we're getting ready to hear the readings. Let me tell you what's coming. The priest can do that, give you a little introduction. The priest can give you an introduction to the Eucharistic, uh, to the Eucharistic prayer. The priest can kind of, like, walk people and talk people through until we get to the Eucharistic prayer. And then it says... You can't stop the flow of the Eucharistic prayer to stop and say something. Now, I have been known to do that. Okay? <laughs> but usually only during a teaching mass. When everybody knows, okay, this is intentional. You know, I don't just, just do it randomly. Um, I would like to more, than, more than, than I do. Because sometimes when I'm up there and I'm, I'm saying those words, right, I just want to stop and say, Wow, did you just hear what we said? Did you just hear what we prayed? Why aren't you smiling? You know? Why aren't you happy? I'm so happy up here I'm about to bust. This is a great word. This is a great prayer. Why are you all like this? Right? So it's hard for me to not break that rule. Let's see. Here's good. Since the celebration of Mass by its nature has a communitarian character, right? Community, one. 
both the dialogues between the priest and the assembled faithful and the acclamations are of great significance. For they are not simply outward signs of communal celebration, but foster and bring about communion between the priest and the people. Okay, goes back to what I was saying. How hard would that be if I had my back to you all? I think it would be really hard. Um, and this is why, because we need to be in communion with each other during the Mass, right? Um, I remember when this new missile came out. Um, I just remember, like, for probably the first six to eight months, just how sad I was. I remember talking to another priest friend of mine, and, and he's like, w what's, what's going on? I said, I'm married to the book. I'm afraid to look away from the book because I'm afraid I'm going to say something wrong or miss something. And so I'm not having this relationship with the people anymore. It's all about the book. And I, I hated that. And so I would like, after mass, I would take the missile, you know, to my apartment and like study it. So as soon as I could, I could get back to knowing where I was so I could look up. Because I like to eyeball people, right? I mean, that's how we form intimacy, isn't it? That's an intimate thing. It just has nothing to do with any of this, but I, I had sugar a while ago. So, um, <laughs> do any of you all in your yards at home have a gazing ball? You know what I'm talking about? That thing you put in your yard, it's a big old globey thing. It's all pretty red or pink or something. Anybody have one of those? Huh? Okay, your mom did, okay. Now, do you know why those were invented? They were, they were pretty. No, 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 they had an intention. Okay, so when a man and woman were courting, they couldn't look each other in the eye. That's why they're called gazing balls, because they would meet in the garden, and I would look at the ball, and you would look at the ball, and I could see your eyes, and you could see my eyes, but I didn't look at your eyes. Yes. Okay, now, this uh, bring up, this was in, you know, several centuries ago. Let's bring it up to kind of the people older than me current times. So, was it okay for a nun to wear patent leather shoes? No, why not? Because there's a reflection, right? And so a sister couldn't wear patent leather shoes because someone may see up their habit. Okay, just saying. I gotta keep you all interested. I hate just reading out of a book. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. The, the importance of singing. The Christian faithful who come together as one in ex expectation of the Lord's coming are instructed by the Apostle Paul to sing together psalms, hymns, and spiritual canticles. Singing is a sign of the heart's joy. Thus, St. Augustine says rightly, Singing is for one who loves. And there is also an ancient proverb, proverb, whoever sing well, prays twice. Whoever sings well, or just sings it all here. <laughs> prays twice. Okay? The main place should be given all things being equal to Gregorian chant as being proper to the Roman liturgy. St. Gregory um, invented the chant, and, and it still should be, just like the organ should be, really. The organ and Gregorian chant are what the church kind of prefer when it comes to liturgical music. Okay, gestures and body, bodily posture. Finally getting to my part, okay. The gestures and bodily posture of both the priest, the deacon, and the ministers, and also the people must be conducive to making the entire celebration resplendent with beauty and noble simplicity to making clear the true and full meaning of its different parts and to fostering the participation of all. Attention must therefore be paid to what is determined by the general instruction and by the traditional practice of the Roman rite and to what serves the common spiritual good of the people of God rather than private inclination or arbitrary choice. Okay, now, once again, when the Roman Missal came out, I had to change things. 
about I had a really beautiful wooden chalice and patent that somebody made for me for my ordination. I used it on very special occasions. It was just, it was beautiful. I didn't use it much, but I used it at special occasions. Well, when the Roman Missal came, was, was revised, it said, any vessel that's used has to be of precious metal. So I had to retire my favorite chalice and patent because that's what the church tell me to do. I don't like it, but it makes sense, and so I do it, right? So everything we do serves the common spiritual good of the people of God and should not be a private inclination or an arbitrary choice. I think we struggle right now with this. I think we struggle. You know, there are fractions in the Catholic Church. There just are, you know. Father so-and-so or Pope so-and-so or my favorite podcast person in the world says, if you really want to do Mass well, this is what you do, right? It's like, hmm. How does that line up with what our bishop asks us to do? Because we are responsible to our bishop. Not the bishop in Evansville, not the bishop in Louisville, not the bishop in Rome, right? We're responsible to our bishop. So when our bishop says, this is what we're going to do in our diocese. And somebody says, I don't care what he says. Right? I don't care what he says. That's not appropriate. I heard from so-and-so that this is better. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I watch TV. And on TV, they do it this way. That might be the way of wherever that TV station is, but that's not the way of the Diocese of Owensboro. So whenever a person or a group of people says, well, I believe or we believe that this is more reverent, you're separating yourself from the body of Christ and there's no room for separation. You know, and I don't, I don't know if any of y'all do this, and if you do, stop. Okay. <laughs> There's a new thing creeping in. I don't know where it's coming from, but it's coming. And it's this. Like through the whole mass, I look out and there's certain people that just, they have their eyes closed and their head down. That doesn't seem to me like active participation. It seems very passive to me. And I'll ask them, I'm not afraid to ask somebody, why are you doing that? Well, I'm just trying to be more reverent. No, because you're not being reverent to the rest of us. Um, I'm trying to be more deliberate. I'm trying to be less distracted. I'm like, does it work? Are you less distracted? Well, maybe, maybe. Well, we are a hierarchy. I'm going to play my card. You distract me when you do that. I'm up there trying to lead the whole community, and when you are in that position, it distracts me. Because I want to come out there and say, Come on! Come on, celebrate with me, celebrate with us. Where did you go, you know? And I, I think about if, if you're having an intimate, if you're having an intimate dinner with someone, if you're having an intimate conversation with somebody, let's say you all are sitting at the dinner table having a romantic, romantic dinner, and all of a sudden he just closes his eyes while you finish dinner. And you're talking to him and he's just like there. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you may think, well, wow, what a great thing. He is so keyed in on me. I don't feel that, would you? No, yeah. So in a practical sense, it doesn't make sense either. You wouldn't do that in a relationship, hopefully with somebody you're intimate with, would you? You don't just close your eyes when you're having a, an intimate conversation with somebody. You, you want to be there. You want to be present. You want to be all in. Um, but somewhere, somehow, some way, it's sneaking in. I don't know where it's coming from. I haven't found it yet, but I'll find it. <laughs> Somebody will goof up and tell me. They saw it on TV. <laughs> right. But it, it's just there. It's just there. And people, you know, you know, there are natural leaders in a church. You know, they're, they're just natural leaders. Some of you people, other people look up to. Do you get that? I mean, Melvin, you know, you're God around here. Shoot. <laughs> you're like the fourth person of the Trinity, you know? So if, if, Melvin, if Melvin starts genuflecting, everybody's going to genuflect, right? Because Melvin is the holiest guy at St. Joseph and Paul. So if Melvin does it, then it must be great, right? <laughs> no, you're scared to come to me. Okay. So it's important, especially those of us who are leaders, in this church, that people see you. If they see you doing something different, they want to do it do, too because they think you're cool. They think you've got it figured out. And so, you know, at Western for 12 years, I saw that. And there'd be some, you know, great leader in, in the college campus ministry. And all of a sudden, they'd read something or see something on TV, you know, and the next thing you know, they're not using their kneeler anymore right like all of a sudden kneelers are not good enough like I got to kneel on the floor I'm not holy enough and I'm like get your butt on the kneeler okay but if I didn't catch it the first day what would happen the next day three more would be kneeling on the floor and the next day 17 more would be kneeling on the floor because well Joe did it and he's cool and he's holy and I'd say to the 17 the third day so uh, why exactly are you doing that well, Joe's doing it. I'm like, so what does it mean to you? I don't know, but Joe does it. Right? I mean, we have a lot of influence on other people, especially the ones who are influential, and you know who you are. Right? You know who you are. So always to take that into consideration, that what you do affects others. Right? What you do affects others. We are a part of the body, and... We all work together, okay? Um, going right along with that, sacred silence. There are times in the Mass for silence. There are times in the Mass to be like this. Anybody know when they are? Huh? Not the consecration. You should be actively involved. You should be as focused on me right then as you are. Oh, this one really kills me. I'm going to rant. Okay. When I say, take this, all of you, do you see how I like show it to everybody? Well, if four of you got your eyes closed, you are not seeing it. Like, how can you close your eyes when Jesus is saying, here is my body. Look, look at this. This is my body. We're, you know, you're just not, it's not, you're not participating. Um, what was I going before that? Oh yeah, when is it okay to be silent? After communion, there should be a sacred silence there. I say, let us pray. And we're supposed to. When the, when the presider says, let us pray before the opening prayer, before the prayer over the gifts, before the prayer at the end of, at, at the end of after communion the priest is supposed to allow us time to pray in silence i'm up let us pray oh god here we are ready to go 
But the rubrics say that the priest is supposed to allow time for silent prayer there. Also, when I say, let us call to mind our sins, there should be sacred silence then, right? So there, there are times that are built in to the liturgy for sacred silence. Unfortunately, a, a lot of us run over it, right? We take it away from you. And, you know, and Patty's not here to like stone me, but, you know, a lot of times, there are times in liturgy where it would be okay to be silent and there's music being played. It's like musicians feel the need to like play music all the time. There's some times when it's just good to be quiet. Right, just some silence. Um, you know, um, going back to something that changed in the Roman Missal, we'll do a little trivia. So, um, I don't know, did Father Carl sing, did y'all ever sing the Lord's Prayer here? Okay, so you sang the Lord's Prayer, you get to the end of deliver us not into temptation, okay? Then the priest would not sing, but he would say the embolism, right? The little part that the priest says, okay? And then we would all sing, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, right? Now, when the new Roman Missal came out, it said that the musician cannot play music while the priest is praying his prayers. Especially there. So that doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen. They shouldn't pay, play instrumental music or anything. But where does it happen? It still happens. Where, Deacon John? You're up there with me when it's happening. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received this bread we offer you. That's a prayer that I'm supposed to be saying out loud. But the musicians, and I'm not dogging on Patty, but a lot of them will do this. They keep that offertory song going until I've washed my hands. But it should stop when I get ready to say, bless you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness. Because you all are supposed to respond what? Blessed be God forever. So we're cheating you all out of that, that dialogue, out of that connection, out of that intimacy that we just read about. Right? I haven't, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how strong she is before I attack her. Um, <laughs> I got to be careful, you know. I mean... I'm never going to come, come at Laura. I'm just saying, she's strong. Um, <laughs> I should have gotten Patty while her leg was broken. But anyway, I didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yes, we're down to two minutes already, which is great. I'm fine because we've got two more weeks. We'll just keep walking through this. If nothing else, we'll get through this in the next four weeks. And if we don't, we'll just keep doing it until 2024. Um, <laughs> any questions, thoughts? On anything that I said? Yes. To our fathers. Yes. I think it might have been one of those things that people just came up with. So she said sometimes when, when okay, it used to be everybody held hands during the Lord's Prayer. Okay. That's one of those things where, where okay, you talk about well, why don't the bishops just all say the same thing? Well, it even gets worse than that. So when it came to holding hands during the Lord's Prayer, our bishop said, you all just do what you want as priest. So, you know, Father Joe and, you know, so-and-so is like, we don't hold hands. That's inappropriate. Well, then I'm like, oh, let's all sing kumbaya and hold hands and hug and kiss, right? Well, that makes it hard on people. The bishop should have just said, no holding hands or hold hands. Just make it clear for us. We can erase that. Okay. Um, so there are some things like that that are just left to the tradition of the parish. Now, I think when, when we quit holding hands during the Lord's Prayer because of COVID, we didn't, we didn't, the priest didn't say, this is what I prefer. The priest should have done better then and said, you know, we're not supposed to hold hands in the Lord's Prayer only if it's with your husband or wife, so the rest of you all should put your hands in your pocket. Or, or the rest of you should hold your hands out. I mean, this is a, a prayer posture. And in the early church, this is how people prayed the Lord's Prayer. Not just the priest, everybody. 
it was a prayer posture to pray the, 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 the Lord's Prayer. So yes, I'm sorry, we've done not good at helping you with that. It's okay until somebody tells you different. <laughs> until I grab you after Mass and say, what are you doing? No, okay. <laughs> yes. Right. It does. But basically, I don't see that happening. Right. <laughs> right. They probably do it on TV too. No, I'm joking. <laughs> you know, um, if the pastor doesn't say anything, then you know, you go with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's some things I leave to the pastor and unless I can't stand it, then I'm going to grab you. Okay? <laughs> but. I mean, as long as, as long as the pastor doesn't really come out and say, this is what we're all going to do, then unfortunately, we all get to do kind of different things. Um, so, yeah. Any other last second thoughts, questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. That's what our diocesan, that's what our diocesan norm is, is that when you come up to receive communion, you should bow your head, just your head, right? The only place that we make a profound bow is where? During the creed, right? And that makes me mad as crazy too. You know, we print off all these little things and give them to you, you know, everybody gets one of these little worship aids when they come in, you know. Am I the only one that reads the creed out of my book? Because if you're reading the creed out of your little booklet, it says right there, Make a profound bow at these words. And I see about three people do it at St. Saint, Saint Joseph and Paul. I hardly ever see anybody. Okay. Okay. A profound bow. This is a profound. You see me do it? I'm trying to lead you up there. I'm like, okay, here we go. I should, if, I, if, if I come up quick, I should only see the tops of your heads, but I come up and here's their way. You know, when that, when that, I mean, when the, when they redid the creed, when they brought the Nicene Creed into the Mass, when we redid the Missal, I was at St., um, uh, at the three parishes down in Fulton, Hickman, and Clinton, and I t trained them, and I said, when you make a profound bow during the creed, your forehead should touch the pew in front of you. And, you know, I was gone for 15 years, and I went back for something. And by golly, they were still doing it. I was so proud of them. I mean, it was the only place I'd seen them do a profound bow. Most people don't do that. But then, but then when, like I said, when our, our diocesan norm is to make a bow of your head at communion, how many people will do this? And it's not the norm. You're only supposed to bow your head. The only place you're supposed to make a profound bow is during the creed. No, oh, when they brought Christ's tabernacle, you're supposed to genuflect. <laughs> um, now, I will say, I think I've double, I will double check, but I think that it does say in the rubrics that, like the, the ministers, when the ministers come up, like the readers, when the readers come up, they should make a profound bow to the altar. I'll, and, we're, and we're getting ready to redo like training and all that stuff, so we've been looking at all that stuff, so... If you're, if you're doing it some way different than that, don't worry about it because we'll beat you up when we have training. Um, but uh, um, yes, there are, some, there, are, there are some things like that that just are not explained well and not, not encouraged. You know, um, <laughs> we're over time. Um, <laughs> and time is very important. So um, hopefully this is helping. Um, please, if things come up and you think, oh, I didn't think about that when we were there, write them down. And I'll try my darndest to answer them when we're together. But we'll just keep walking through the, the, the missal. This is where it's at, folks. This is where we learn the most about the liturgy is from this missal. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, be safe and enjoy this day. Watch out for trick-or-treaters. I think they're already out, right? So be careful. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 